So as I said, welcome today to Green Participatory Budget and looking at what it is and what role we can play in supporting the climate action. Um, this is part of the European caravan sessions that we're running. Um, and a, background, a bit of a background to that is we are partnering up with Spain, Portugal, France and Scotland to look at how participatory budgeting works across Europe, specifically in relation to green cities and green PB. Today we have got a speaker talking about what green participatory budgeting looks like across the world. Um, so yeah, it's part of the, the training suite. Portugal event started in October. We are hosting this month. Barcelona is also hosting this month and then it goes to Santa Greve. And it all finishes in Grenoble at the OIPD conference where they'll be learning about this right across the world and there will be recommendations made for future participatory budgeting. And I hope I've got that all right, but if I haven't, I'm sure that will, um, Eves will pick it up a wee bit later. A little bit about myself, my name is Francesca Lynch, I am a development manager at SCDC um, and SCCC are the leads for community development in Scotland. Um, we obviously work for Active, Inclusive and Just Scotland where our communities are strong, equitable and sustainable. We work directly with frontline organisations as well as development practitioners and policy makers. Um, we support PB Scotland and the P Green PB Action Group. A little bit more about me and that I was a um, recent addition to the SCDC team. So since January, I've been leading on Green PB and looking at the exploratory phase round about what it is and where we can take it. Not knowing who the participants were today, I thought it would be quite good to give a brief introduction to what participatory budgeting is. And for the rest of the presentation, you'll probably hear me referring to as PB because it is really a difficult thing to say, especially when you try to present and especially when you speak as fast as I do. So what is participatory budgeting? Really, it is just a way for people to decide on how public money should be spent. It is as simple as that. It's about getting people involved in decisions that will affect them and their communities and letting them have a say on where money is directed. It has various different models right across the world. It started in Brazil and has been replicated in pretty much the whole of the world. But in a Scottish context, we look at it in kind of two main themes. So we'll look at what we call small grants or community PB and also mainstream and participatory budgeting. Now, this, the small grants PB is usually ring faced pots of money that's disseminated within communities. And that's where it's voted on and that's where the process is decided. And the mainstream is where we're looking at bigger public budgets. Most recently, the, the big 1% commitment to mainstreaming from all our local authorities. But I'll speak a wee bit about that just in a few minutes. So PB is where people decide on where money is spent. Um, I think as a bit of a context, PB has been happening in Scotland now for about almost eight years, so just pre-2014. Um, and in the, the, the kind of eight years, there's been loads happening, <laughs> including the development of a charter for PB. And this is what you can see here. Um, this charter was co-produced by Frontline's PB practitioners, people in the PB field, experts from outside Scotland, and also involved people that went on to become part of the National PB Steering Group and also PB Action Groups. Now, what this sets out is just what you can expect from a PB process. This is the key principles round about any process and that the, it should be fair and inclusive. It should be participatory, deliberative. It should empower people. It should be creative and flexible, transparent, and most importantly, it should become part of our democracy. So that's the principles that underpin participatory budgeting. What we found through all our PB work today and also developing the charter is that there's numerous benefits associated with PB in general. So they're all there. I won't I won't read them all out, but you can see they're all rounds about strong relationships, trust, respect, targeting resources to local communities and encouraging innovation from local communities as well, recognising that quite often 
people in power don't necessarily have all the answers and you need to look to your communities to actually find what works for them. So there's obviously benefits for, for participatory budgeting. And kind of moving on to what and why green participatory budgeting. Um, green participatory budgeting is a kind of a new term. However, it's not necessarily a new thing, if that makes sense. So in all the participatory budgets we have seen in the last eight years, there has always been an aspect of um, environmental or climate action in there. So we see this through things like the development of play parks, or the development of um, community gardens, bike swapping schemes. There's been loads and loads and loads of environmental activity, but we've never attributed them necessarily to green participatory budgeting. So obviously now with the commitment from the Scottish Government to just transition and the shift towards climate justice and um, net zero, we're now looking at participatory budgeting as a way to further that action. Participatory budgeting is a participatory process. It's not the only one there, but it is one that gains really good traction with local people. It's tangible, people, it's easy to understand and people, under, um, people can see it right through. So therefore, this year, we are looking at how can we use participatory budgeting to further the green agenda? Green PB is just a thematic form of PB. The PB process is always the same, regardless of what field you put it into, whether it be youth PB, whether it be green PB, whether it be health PB, it's always the same process round about the deliberation with local communities, the voting on priorities, and then people, real, real projects submitted by people getting funded. Essentially, what we found from what we've the discussions this year is that on top of the benefits of PB, when you apply it to green PB, PB or climate change, you can shift local people's attitudes towards climate change. You can give them a sense of joint responsibility and you can reduce their carbon footprint. And it encourages them to be a wee bit more innovative about the green ideas. And we've seen this because some of the learning where we have spoken to people who have been involved in green activity, when you speak to them about climate change, they understand it a wee bit better. So it's taken it in that chunk of chunk of bites, whereas we're saying to communities, you were part of this process, you have done your, your free cafe and your local hub, do you know that you have then increased and reduced your carbon footprint? And when they say no, that's when you can open up the discussions around about climate change. So that's another major benefit from um, Green PB and using PB. So that's kind of a whistle stop tour of what and why Green PB and participatory budgeting. Just going to move on quickly to the national PB journey. So just to set this in a kind of national context so that we can recognise for people that's not familiar with participatory budget. And this is not a new thing. Um, as I said, it's been here since 2014 minimum. Um, and today the government have invested 6.5 million in participatory budget. And now the figures are right until 2020. They've also as part of the learning and part of the discussions, they implemented an agreement between the Scottish Government and COSLA where the 1% of council budgets will be subject to PB. That has been slowed down because of COVID, but what we're hearing from COSLA at the minute is that's now starting to pick back up again. And most importantly for the green PB aspect of this, participatory budget was recognised by the Just Transition Commission. Um, as a way forward, and we've actually got that there, it's recommendation 13, where they said that this could be put at the heart and they talk about targeting some money towards it. That's actually came into fruition just recently with this year's programme for government, again, including green participatory budgeting. And this year, a million pound has just been committed from the Just Transition budget for this year to the North East for a PB process that I will speak a bit, wee bit about later on. There, there is hopes also, I should say, about this. This is the first year of participatory budget and being rolled into Just Transition. But if this pans out really well, we're hoping that it can be written in the next 10 years, because that's a 10-year fund with £500 million up to grab. Just a little bit about the structures to let you understand where participatory budget fits into government. Um, obviously, well, not obviously, you won't know this, but it's the community empowerment team within Scottish Government. They head up their participatory budgeting. Um, we have commitment from two really key, key 
members of staff are very supportive of participatory budget and have been on that journey, one of them since its, its very beginnings. We also have a national PB strategic group that feeds into government and they have recently released their framework for the next five years. And what you see here is the five themes that's coming through that framework. Um, most importantly for this session, under the cross and priorities theme, you'll see there a Green PB Action Group, and this is where the green stuff kind of lies. So then the PB Action a Strategic Group looks across the whole of the, out, of the landscape for participatory budgeting, but they also have specific targets, which I think is my next slide, which might be a wee bit better, yes. So this is the priorities, 16 priorities for the next five years for the National Strategic Group. And as you will see there, under number seven is climate justice. Now, this is a kind of important step for us, um, mainly because this is what has allowed SCDC and the government to come to an agreement to undertake the exploration of green participatory budgeting. So this is a big driver for basically my position within SCDC. You look at it and start to have the conversations and start the learning rounds about how can we use this better? How can we use green PB to achieve some of the targets associated with just transition? I'm going to move on to PB in practice now. And I'm hoping is Eve's here. No? Oh, he's not here yet. This this will be interesting. Oh, here he's. Oh, here here he is. He just came into. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's okay. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to settle in. Um, I'm just going to speak a wee bit about our flagship examples of green PB, at, ongoing at the minute. As I said, it's a new process for us this year. It really has. We ha really have been looking at it um, as a learning journey for this year. Um, it's just been really fortunate that the Green PB caravan has came along at this time. It's been really timely for us. Um, and also just want to nudge in the direction of two big exemplar projects. So these are the ones that we will be learning from this year in Scotland. The first being the Dundee Climate Fund. So Dundee has recently announced just back in September there a £750,000 fund disseminated in a PB process targeted towards their climate change strategy for Dundee. That will run over four years and there'll be two rounds of the funding and it is all tied into basically achieving their climate change strategy which, which relates to just transition and net zero. It's a really big, big project and actually what's been nice about it is that there is lots of local authorities now getting into the conversation around about how can they look at their PB targets in relation to achieving some of their climate change priorities and Dundee I think will be the one that everybody is watching. So I think on the back of this hopefully if everything goes well you'll start to see more and more local authorities looking at how they can include climate within their PB activities. The second one on the screen there is the Just Transition Participatory Budget Fund. Um, this is the one that I made reference to earlier. This is a million pounds that's been targeted from the Just Transitions Fund to local communities in the northeast of Scotland, them being Murray, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. This is a really interesting fund and one that we're watching very closely because this is not a mainstream fund, this is a community fund. So this money has been put out for communities to access, for them to come up with ideas and projects that will help them reduce climate emissions. It's a huge amount of money. It's the biggest amount of money ever committed at the one time to participate in budgeting alone, let alone green participatory budgeting. So it really is one we're watching. And what's really good about this is that the government have entered into an agreement with third sector interfaces, and local community voluntary organisations. So they are the ones that's leading on this project. They are the ones that's holding the funding and they are the ones that's looking at the applications and doing the whole process behind it. So it really has been handed over to community ownership here. They presented yesterday, and for anybody it wasn't at the launch session yesterday, it really was a fantastic presentation in that their voting has literally, their deadline for applications has literally just closed. They have £333,000 for each community to spend. Two of them have broke a million pounds with the application that's come in. 
and one of them, which is the smallest one, which has under 100,000 people, has almost broke the million pounds. So that just gives you a flavour of the appetite that's there for this fund and how, how hard they've worked to get these application forms in. And I think at this minute, I'm going to stop sharing because that's the two big ones I wanted to speak about. I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I'm going to pass to Eves, if Eves is here, who is going to take us through some examples of where this happens in Scotland and beyond. Can you can you see? Let me see. We can, Eves. We can. All right. So, um, good afternoon to everybody. And I understand that today, what we're trying to do is, what is it in terms of Green PB and what role can it play in supporting climate action? What I want to share with you now is based on. This comparative analysis and a couple of more cities actually which joined and yesterday I was amazed and today too about the, what's happening in Scotland actually so I think that some dots are missed here but so basically uh, what I want we examined 4,400 projects you know in, in in all these cities one by one and one of the key lessons that we were interested in was to know what, what kind of projects are being funded, you know, and, and selected. So the presentation here, it's the first time I'm doing it. And when I try to have a look at these green PB projects across the board, you know, in different regions of the world, we detected six categories of projects and I like to share with you these six categories to see how green PB is actually implemented what kind of projects are being funded all right so I showed that yesterday but it's a typical um, modality the first modality which is adaptation to the effects of climate change and it's by far the highest number this is in Portugal, wildfires, uh, as, as you can see on top of the uh, of the screen. And one of the projects, which was out of the box so far in, in the whole Portugal, construction of a mega water tank of around 50,000 euros to enable local associations to better fight devastating fires. So what is interesting here is that through PB, the, there was a community-based decision on how to place the tank, you see. So it's a, it's a sort of spatial justice which is ingrained in that sort of project, but typical adaptation. Another one which I showed as well yesterday, uh, I'm here in this in Indonesia, in Semarang, uh, Indonesia, very exposed to high rise, um, to, to, to high rise of the sea on these uh, 17,000 islands. And what has been approved through very tight participation of communities is the protection actually of, of, the, of the slums, which are uh, directly flooded. So this sort of sandbags, which is for today adaptation, it's another sort of, of projects that um, are a little bit below the, the, the below the um, the radar of what is usually being done in that sort of thing. Now, what was counterintuitive is that I want to move in the second category. On my right, adaptation to the effect of, of climate change, heavy rains, South Kivu, and um, you have bridges which are disrupted and through PB, they rebuilt seven of these um, of these bridges, typical adaptation. But on the other side, which was counterintuitive, is that some of the project, I mean, one of the projects voted was the uh, reforestation project. And interestingly enough, in a very poor community, uh, the, the money was a trigger for youth mobilization, volunteer work to uh, reforest uh, the mountains that were damaged. This is very unique. I thought at the beginning that 
the south was basically adaptation and north had more possibility to mitigate the effects and as a matter of fact it's not that clear we should work a little bit more but that's quite interesting in, in truly devastated regions now a third mobility we are still on what i call physical projects it's uh, here i mean an interesting uh, initiative it's bordeaux you know on the garonne river in france uh, and they have a thematic pb 100 percent on sustainable development they put all the money on on this this was the first one actually that i knew of and what they have done is a mix of adaptation and, and mitigation uh, citywide fruit tree planting and open spaces projects are part of a great two green letters that uh, aim to transform the city of stone tarmac and concrete into a more environmentally friendly place what is interesting is that they started in places that were being flood flooded uh, by the Garonne, you know, which is in contact with the Atlantic uh, Atlantic Ocean, but uh, 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 and, and the rise as well. So these constant flooding are uh, needing adaptation. So you have a both approach there, which I found interesting. Mind you, we haven't gone enough into these definitions, you know, on what is adaptation and mitigation. A fourth mo modality is quite a unique. Uh, PB, one of the first I know of, which is in uh, Cerveira and Tomino. It's on both sides of the border between Portugal and the um, and Galicia. I mean, the, the north, uh, which is part of Spain, you know, and Oliver will appreciate this one um, as it's, it's country of origin and, and, and region of origin. So what is interesting here is that it's a very tiny project, this a small one, I would say, where both the youth of both sides of, of, the, of the border are joining effort to try to, to find solutions and raising awareness. So you are, you are not in building stuff. You are here one day by National Children Works, you know, transforming recycled materials into art. But it's a raising awareness for the youth. It's much, much cheaper than what I showed you before. And the other one is a binational one-day climate impact discovery visit, which is crucial. Why? Because it, I mean, climate change effects are on both sides of a river. You know, they don't stop because they, you, have a, a, you have simply a, a border there and you show your passport. Not at all. And quite crucially, this river uh, has been, a, I mean, the, the trouble with it have been affecting, I mean, agriculture. This is an agricultural region. So having these youth PB on both sides, uh, it's a way for them to build the future, not Portugal on one side, Spain on the other one, but getting the same awareness. So that's something which should exist, you know, in other countries, you know, to not have a national based. We need binational uh, ones. But fourth modality training awareness raising projects there are plenty of them yeah but they are eligible so th that's a, a clear fourth modality a fifth modality are um, early warning projects those of you who were here yesterday you will remember what i is showing you um, about russia with the early warning system you know for wildfires which were affecting crops but in a very significant way and here uh, here I'm in uh, Monterrey, uh, metro region in, in, in San Pedro Garcia Garcia. And one of the requests and the ideas, which was transformed into an, an app, it's an alert system because of inversion of uh, inversion of temperature, the city is extremely contaminated. And sometimes so high that it's impossible here. I'm in a school so high <clears throat> that children from here at secondary school, uh, they cannot go out to make sports, you know. So they adapted the, the, the situation to have sports inside this building, which was built through uh, PB. But more interestingly, now you have an app developed, 
which indicates to anybody, to the youth, but to, to the people as well, uh, what, uh, what is the, uh, the, the contamination of uh, the contamination and pollution of the air. So we are totally in a different sort of project. And it's part of this, I would say, a significant category out of the ones we examined, which is early warning. You know, for the people to be aware before the fight starts or before uh, you have a flood or a tsunami, etc. You know, that, that's an, another side of the adaptation, which has been largely under, under considered uh, by, um, I mean, policies I know of. <clears throat> and here is one which is much, I mean, it's less common, I would say, even if they exist which are studies and information systems. So you are not in, in building, planting trees or a reforestation or a building reservoirs, but it's, look at that case, Molina de Segura, it's in Murcia region. One of the projects in 2019 was a study, which is significant for 70,000 inhabitant cities, yeah, which was 26,000 euros on collective electricity consumption. They said, we are not going to work on open spaces and using LEDs or using uh, other solutions. No, we want as citizens um, to have an overview of what is spent on what, where, in order to uh, be the first step finding solution based on renewable energies. So you see, what is interesting here is that people and communities in this is very strong community, uh, assemblies and a federation of, of neighborhoods, and they are the one thinking, <coughs> thinking ahead. They are not letting that for policy. So you, you see how a project can lead to policy changes. And it's not, I would say, this is a category that I saw now recently in Argentina uh, with a university um, program where the students are supporting uh, very small communities in uh, very small municipalities in Argentina and leading to tremendous solutions based on studies and, and, and research and implant, implementing them in public spaces. And I, I know that's the topic you're interested in. So I wanted to mention this sixth modality. And here is a bonus. What I see emerging is a large number of projects which have been accelerated and amplified before because of COVID related to food and access to food. And yesterday, when some of you were uh, seeing, I think it's Kathleen, uh, was saying about community gardens and urban agriculture, this is typically something which has never been uh, written upon. I, I want to start actually something on that, you know, to show that. And what is interesting here is that it's not only urban ag or community gardens and, and that sort of thing even if they are a good share of these new projects, you know, related to, to rethinking food and understanding its, its consequence on, uh, on the planet, you know, the, of transition. So you have that part, I would say production, let's say. Then you have support to agro-industries. It's all along the food chain. And, and this is very interesting and we should have that as a very clear sort of bonus, you know, understanding. And here I'm taking you in this huge 500 projects a year, uh, Cuenca uh, with $100, more than $100 per inhabitant per year. You can imagine what it would be in any of the cities you were mentioning, where you have organic farming, but at the same time, if you look at the picture, you have the whole transformation of, of products, you know, in, in more rural parishes which are the vast majority in that, uh, in that uh, city. So see the, here, what I think amazing is how PB has left a little bit this sort of social side to move into economic dimension and job generation 
with new green jobs, you know, but based on uh, organic farming, on uh, women's group, etc. And that's something which should take the temperature about, you know. And you go to the States and you have uh, highways which are transformed for a direct phase between producers and consumers. So I go along my, my chain. Uh, recycling of um, of agro uh, of of food, so that's probably one thing. Uh, considering uh, Scotland, that um, will emerge probably, and that probably should be much more developed because access to food everywhere I go now it's a big issue. And if we do not rethink the food system as people are doing, actually, uh, we won't miss the, 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 we won't miss the train. So that's something I wanted to let you just have a sense of it. Um, I, I would just go, I don't want to take too much of a time, you know, the time is short, um, but look at the bottom. Why do they emerge and multiply? They are driven fundamentally if you take all these six categories plus the theme of food uh, driven by the need to address very specific multiple effects of climate change rather than by international agendas or programs that's why they are so crucial to generate new ideas it's uh, this is a gold mine for for our common future uh, and climate sensitive PBs are the results of the dramatic effect that population suffers from. And I think that we should start from the suffering of people instead of the big agenda that's, that, that, that we're working with. Uh, here are what I said is mostly in the first one, in the first two. And uh, th there's another one that you might be interested in, which goes much more into detail. That's my most uh, recent uh, one on, on that, which is greening cities through PB with very concrete um, answers from uh, Lisbon and from Molina de Segura. And, it, and it's in English, then it's more accessible in, in, in the UK. All this, you have the contacts. I think that's um, uh, Francesca, you have them and uh, you, we can disseminate them. So uh, it could be a way also to, to continue this dialogue and uh thank you i won't try to pronounce you know the gaelic but i saw that apparently this is what you say so i will limit myself with thank you and very pleased to be part of the conversation thank you so much for inviting me that's it perfect thanks you okay oliver and then philip well i suppose hi everybody um, I suppose I just wanted to pick up on David's comment in the chat, um, which is the classic question about PB. Is just a is this just a process that um, fosters competition rather than collaboration? Is this about you know having a limited fund and then asking people to to just fiercely compete with each other? Um, and that's really, really far from the spirit of PB and, and indeed the history of PB. And I think if we'll be able to, to add to that as well, um, and for, for two reasons, I'll give two reasons, but there are many more. Um, one of them, I mean, just without necessarily going into the history of PB and, you know, its radical contribution across the world and all kinds of uh, issues, especially on poverty and social exclusion, on, on social justice issues, and increasingly on climate justice issues. But in terms of the format itself, um, you know, the one thing to remember is that, is, is take, for example, the Northeast Just Transition Fund that for the pilot just now. Now that one million is is part of a twenty million just transition fund. The other nineteen million, uh, I'm not quite sure how they are going to be allocated. And this is what we need to remember that the difference here is that in this case, at least, this is not going to be down to a very complex bureaucratic application process that that is unreachable for communities. In this case, communities will decide, right? So there is no um, you know committee behind closed doors that the size and the allocation of that million. This is open. And in being open, it invites all kinds of community groups and organizations that otherwise wouldn't go for this kind of funds to mobilize and put forward proposals for action. 
And even those that don't get funded, they do make connections throughout the process and they might try in the second round or in the next round um, by joining forces with others. Or indeed, and this is hopefully what's going to happen, or that's my hope for the 1 million, the 1 million will become 20 million and the 20 million will become 100 million. So that them, you know, because if we demonstrate that this can mobilize capacity and action and energy and support all the good community led activity that is already out there and boost it, then to me, that's, that's a collaborative force. But yes, it does come down to a vote. But in many ways, a vote in a transparent process, I think is better than a committee behind closed doors uh, that is not in the hands of communities themselves. So that would be my immediate answer. There's more that can be said, but just as an initial response. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, I mean, just following on from Oliver's comment there about, um, about the voting, I suppose, really. Um, I, I don't have any direct experience of PV myself, so I'm just wondering how, how that voting happens and how, how it doesn't just turn into a sort of beauty contest, but there, there is a real opportunity for proper deliberation uh, on, on the choices that need to be made. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, and specifically to, sorry, um, Philip, specifically to just transition in Aberdeen or voting in general and across PV. Uh, I, I mean, in general, yeah, I mean, examples, yeah. Yeah, there's various things we can do to make the voting as fair and equal as possible. Um, what we've seen in the past and what was a big factor in PB and Oliver and Eve can back this up or maybe not agree with it, but we'll see. But in the past here, what a lot of the time has been done is things like marketplaces, videos, um, so that when the community come in, they get to speak to all the projects that are, are wanting to um, or have an application form in, the reasoning behind it, all that kind of stuff. So they get a lot of information in person before they actually place their votes. That's a wee bit more difficult online, but what they've been trying to replicate online is kind of discussion areas or areas where you get more information on the projects as well as backing that up. And this is what will happen in the Aberdeenshire case, back up with various days round about certain villages and stuff where people can get more access to further information. The voting itself can be done in a number of ways and, and most commonly it is a spread vote. And, and what that means is that people will have a, a like a number of votes so they don't just get one vote when they come along. They, it depends on the number of applications that's actually in, they get a representative number. And what that is trying to do is to stop the inequalities where you maybe have a really strong community group with X amount of members and a really small community group with the card, hardly any members. When you put the spread voting in, it means that people, if they want to be eligible and actually take part in the process, need to vote for more than one um, project. So it kind of spreads the vote right across the process. There's other ways of doing it as well. There's, there's things like weighted voting, where if you've got really small groups with really low amounts of members, like a vote for them will maybe equate to more points than for a bigger group with a bigger amount of um, members and potentially bigger income. So there's ways and means that you can do the voting just to round up. There's ways and means to make it equal and just. And that's what um, Patty A Good Process should look like. And, that, and that's what we encourage through participatory budget. And so I hope that answers your question. I've got a few hands going up. This is good. I'll start with Jordi. Um, just to uh, help with Philip's question there, um, I have two experiences of PB in the area that I live in, which is in the Scottish borders. Uh, one was I was delivering a climate uh, challenge project, and part of that was we were given a, some money outside the project to deliver um, uh, microfunding to the community, and we did it on basis of, of a participatory basis so we had a um uh, a vote but it was an event day so all the organizations that requested the funding 500 pounds maximum we had a little bit of a an event day that they set out their stalls and explained what their vision was what they wanted to do and the community was invented over that's in a small that's in a on an estate of about three and a half thousand people so like-minded uh, and the so that worked out very well um, uh, and again, it built capacity within, you have an event, so you have a bit of collaboration between the groups and people are talking to people and, and all that strength builds out of it. Now, the other example was just very budget 
based on the area partnerships of the local council. And they were given out to the five local area partnerships of what they have. And my experience is in one of those areas where they were based on, on um, a set of funds, a pot A and a pot B. And a pot A was the larger funds and they used participatory budgeting for that. And again, the same process was put into place where you have, um, you put in your, your application, had to, to follow certain guidelines and then those were accepted the ones that followed the guidelines were accepted to be put in part of the process and then there were event days where they met and the public were invited out to sit and and, and people could put up their stall and discuss and again there's a good collaboration i was at the events um, and there were not a large amount of participation um uh but the two issues kind of that arose from that is one is that that was across both rural and urban areas so the projects that were based in urban areas had a high participatory value in that sense that they were in they had a lot of people that were going to uptake their project versus the smaller rural areas would maybe be a project of of just the same quality but they were in a village of two or three hundred people that they didn't have the power of the vote um so effectively the participatory money went to the urban area um, and the, the, whereas I think up in the Northeast and the NESCAN, what they've done is, is distributed. They, they've kind of realized that and put one third into the urban area of, of, of Aberdeen, spread a, th a third to the rural area of Aberdeenshire, and then a third to the urban area of, of Maury, or the rural area of Maury. So, so that's kind of, a, that, that is maybe being addressed in that area, but it, be conscious of that, I think, is, is who you're, who is participants and how they can have a just and again, again, going back to the council, the voting system was an online system. So again, that was not a just way to vote because it, it left out a lot of people. So it was just an online system. So there are there are learning curves there, certainly. Perfect. Thank you. Gordy, that was a really good input. Um, I'm going to pass to Eves now to see if he's got anything to comment on the voting. And then we'll come to you on that just after. No. All right. That, um... I would like to, to continue the conversation on the competition versus collaboration, you know, which will affect the way you vote. Um, now there is a greater ad attention by people like you, those working on, on PB, which is to have these workshops of co-construction, of co-building of projects. So when I look at I mean, the, my budget cycles, you know, from one city with another one. I had recently the, the topic in, uh, in when I was working with Lisbon and, and, and in Vienna. And usually you don't have enough time for the co-construction of projects. Mm. Many projects are similar and can be a way actually to get community to know each other. So you are generating social fabric through the formulation of projects and you are the usually i mean guys like us who are you know engaged in in, in pbs uh, have a role to play and i i saw that for instance in paris they invited me and they had plenty of proposals and one of the jobs of the whole municipality was to say hey these guys could work with this one that could work with this one at the end of the day from the 39 39 34 that we heard yesterday you find yourself with much less uh, projects much more consolidating it's a learning it's a learning through uh, uh it can be on platform but it works better when it's face to face so you have one day with six seven tables where people who have been making making ideas projects are listening and trying to elaborate better so you really generate collaboration versus competition you have less projects and, and people are happy with that usually so that that's quite important but because it has an impact on the voting now on the voting uh I, i'm part actually of, of of a few guys who are saying like montevideo or lisbon that i was mentioning that we think we should uh, de-digitalize pbs i mean keeping obviously the digital word but we think that we need to make an effort to de-digitalize and this word doesn't exist, but the concept could be uh, taken up. And what I see even, uh, I was mentioning Paris, is that you have mobile, it, it, the place where you vote is important. And I, I would like to tell a little bit on 
the new ways of high in hybrid system where you are usually a platform of new ways for um offline uh, voting you have for instance in in, in paris bicycle i mean to show that it's no energy or uh, with voting boxes transparent that are moving from a market to a central uh, to a, a public space and they go where people are so you, it's not that people go to a specific place but you go you go for having these votes and that's quite interesting what was uh, I mean somehow a failure is that what Belo Horizonte wanted to do to have these posting uh, these voting places in supermarkets or hypermarkets so they gathered a huge amount of votes but they were very very significant very little people were not engaged they were pressing buttons but when you have the same exercise uh, for instance, on, on PB for schools now, there is something that uh, the youngsters li like a lot, which are all these tablets and iPad and iPad, etc. And so on a, on a one day, you have all the school voting with the tablet and in instantaneously you have all your votes which appear. So it's a good use of, of digital technologies to see what is being done. And uh, that's another side. What I hear very much upon is if we are co coherent with uh, the social perspective of, of PB is uh, it, it's to have that located in social centers, in community development centers, which are the place to have that sort of vote. So the location is just as important as the process. That's, that's my main uh, uh, conclusion or suggestion on, on that is issue and hybrid system trying to digitalize in order to have the excluded voting. Migrants, people of other languages, people with less capacities, which is at the point in time we worked a lot on um, people who couldn't see and once they started to vote they were seen as a part of the social groups so the voting aspect was so crucial you know you have a special line for people who were not able to to to, to see and they won projects you know so it's a way as well the voting moment that's a symbolic value in, in in democracy so that's something probably that would deserve a little bit more of of uh, reflection i finalize with one comment which i'm not surprised, I don't know enough what's happening in, 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 in your country, but um, the usually when there is little money in order, in order to avoid competition, there's a rule which are usually democratically voted. Again, I, let's go to Cuenca because I mentioned it, you know, with some criteria like vulnerability in front of flooding uh, etc you get more points which would lead you with more resources you do not apply resources evenly do you have formula and there are plenty of them this is a whole word where one parish rural parishes could have hundred thousand and another one five hundred thousand so it's it's not small and this i think is spatial justice at its best and uh, social justice as, at its best with criteria on climate change, which are now plugged in. It's quite interesting because do you put your money where the needs are socially, spatially, climatically. So you are introducing a, a rule with number of inhabitants, uh, jobs existing or not, and employment level of services where you are part of a policy which goes through climate but which is especially and socially just and i see that you are a little bit evenly uh distributing resources evenly you know you, you have not this sort of uh, criteria based method which i think it's a regulatory role that uh, i've seen working very well and which is usually respected if it's if it's elaborated with communities and people and everybody is happy to have that. Yes, this is instrument to social uh, and, and, and climate justice. But this would deserve longer conversation, maybe. Yeah. 
No, thank you very much. I think your reflections are very really well received, Even I think you make very valid points about how we, I suppose it goes back to that planning of that participation and, and as much as we should always in every exercise we do look at how we engage people and, and, and maximise the participation where possible. PB is no different so I suppose that alludes back to how do we plan stuff, how do we make sure most people can be involved, how are we implementing our national um, the national standards for community engagement to make sure we're maximising and reducing inequalities as we go. So it's a very valid point, and you're right, it deserves probably a much longer conversation around about that. And okay, um, yeah, I'm um, just thinking about the climate challenge fund, which somebody mentioned, and we've had a number of projects that were funded was were, were funded by that. Um, and our frustration was that you couldn't you couldn't do a follow on project that was similar. They wanted something new and shiny the next time. And um, my worry is that with all these projects, they're often short term. And then you've got to sort of start thinking, you know, uh, of something new and exciting. And often it's the follow on that make saves the most carbon because you haven't got to sort of set everything up again you know you've got everything there i mean we're still using e-bikes that are 10 years old now and um you know they they we had two different project funding but now we've just got a simple partnership with a couple of local businesses and they hired bikes for us so i mean i, I think the and and also as time progressed with the Plant challenge fund the uh, application process got more and more complicated um, and you didn't necessarily, what, what you were asked to produce in terms of proof didn't actually necessarily match what, you know, what, what the real, the real carb, um, carbon savings. Um, and now it's gone all together, which is, you know, is, is frustrating because, you know, for all the, those drawbacks we engaged we did a huge amount of community engagement and I think that the amount of carbon we saved was was pretty significant um probably more than that same money spent on some government projects some you know government thing um I think the Highland Council did try and do a bit of participatory budgeting of their budget a couple of times um and you basically you know, this is our budget. What would you like to to sort of what would you like to cut basically? Because there wasn't enough money, um, and the trouble is that um, the things that affect most people tend to be the most popular to spend money on. Uh, the things that only so affect a few people aren't so popular. Um, so you uh, end up with this frustration in terms of additional needs budget well that only affects a few people so that didn't have as much priority as something else um, and I don't know how you get get around that in terms of green projects um, you know if you realize that only a few people are you know a, a small proportion of people are, are cycling at the moment then they're mainly the people that are engaged in getting better facilities whereas what you want is the majority of people to be cyclists but how do you convince the people that are mainly motorists at the moment that really it's in their interest to spend money on cycling or active travel or whatever right I think that's probably enough for me no thank you very much and it's actually quite time you're talking about that because after the break we're going to I'm going to try and open a wee conversation round about funding because um, it's something that's come up quite often in relation to participatory budget and we've had a few discussions within our team, our PB team round about it and, and we'll maybe explore that in a wee bit more um, detail next. I mean it's not going to be any great shakes or like any epiphanies but it would be nice to start to open the conversation round about funding participatory budget. And, um, so Francesca, and... Oh sorry I never seen your hands. No sorry to interrupt, it's just super quick because if we are going for the break in one minute and if is leaving in one minute and we don't have him for the next hour. Can we give if this minute just to address before he goes that point made by Anne about, um, yeah, uh, you know, when there is an issue that is urgent and needs attention, but maybe it doesn't catch a crowd of people to support it. Uh, if, if you have anything to say on that, if before you go. One is, see, 
this is so crucial that in in some uh, places now they are setting a minimum number for a project to be approved a number of votes in order not to de 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 legitimize what is being done saying sometimes it's 10 20 people it's not enough so this mobilization by the people themselves of going for votes is an essential part and what i've been uh, what i've seen which worked bet very very interestingly is when you have a one minute it's called uh, like pitches you know of one minute where people are speaking and presenting their projects in order to capture votes and to inform so on the local platform or local tv you have all these projects which are being presented in order to reach your minimum standard of votes so using media to be uh, part of that uh, of that effort and going back to what i was saying i was surprised in stravopol in, in in the region in in, in russia in, in caucasus that they were so keen to have people presenting from community that the physical voting was two votes and if you are voting through uh, the platform you had only one point one vote so it was a promotion to say we need to be together we you need to pass to discuss with others and i was impressed because it worked people were moving because they have more vote than somebody just sitting behind his, his computer or sms and, and voting you know so there are different ways to gain votes but it's about votes as well you know that what i think but i mean it's so rich to listen to all of you that uh who am i you know to say i think well, that th thank that you thing. thank you so much it's been amazing sorry francesca i interrupted but i just thought eve is leaving and many many colleagues here might not know but eve has been in the pbs space for 30 years and he was in porto Alegre when it all started in 89 in brazil so that, that's why i wanted to get that perspective there so thanks a lot Eve. all right it was a pleasure meet you soon Perfect. Yes. Thank you, Eve. Sorry, I didn't realise you were leaving. Safe travels. So maybe just um, one point that I want to pick up from the Jamboard. Somebody put a really good comment in or question around about getting teenagers politically uh, and engaged in the political process. Um, what I will say about there, there's lots of activity going on in schools around about participatory budgeting and there's lots of activity obviously around about climate change in local schools with the kind of United um, the sustainability goes to the United Nations and they're learning for sustainability. So we are seeing lots of learning coming from schools round about climate knowledge for young people and also coupling that with um, participatory budget where they're actually getting to do their own processes, develop them, put their own ideas and vote. We're seeing that swing towards young people getting much more motivated in that kind of political um, area and that's been seen right across the world. And some of the stuff that's coming out of America is quite groundbreaking in that their young people do go on to become much more involved in the political processes and much more inspired about getting involved in that and what they want to do. So there's some really good learning around about how this fosters that involvement in democracy, because it fundamentally it is. It's, it, it's setting that foundation for local democracy and young people getting involved in that. Um, there's loads of links as well. At the end, I'll put a slide up that has links to PB Scotland. And you can go in there and look at all the youth activity that's ongoing, especially um, one really big thing this year is that South Lanarkshire Council have committed 5% of their PEF budgets to go out through um, participatory budget in all their schools that receive it. And they, I think something like £700,000 last year was disseminated in the schools through participatory budget. And one of the schools were so successful that they are now allocating 20 percent of that budget for their, their young people and that's in a secondary school as well so it is teenagers um so really really good work going on there so just keep an eye on that so just want to kick off a wee bit of a discussion around about the funding for pb as i said a wee bit earlier this is something we've been having kind of internal discussions at scdc round about it can be really difficult. It's quite a difficult landscape for PB funding and where to find out where to get that funding, where there's actual pots of money you can go for that funding. So I suppose it's just this is a kind of starter for six to start that discussion 
roundabout funding PB. So what I want to talk today about probably just round about the traditional V innovation. So obviously the Climate Challenge Fund has come up. We know that there's big national funds there that people can submit bids for. Not many of them offer PB as a kind of set structure. There used to be the um, Community Choices funding, which was the big flagship Scottish Government funding. That's now been rolled into the Invest in the Communities Fund. So as much as you can still apply for funding to run PB processes, it's involved in a bigger fund. As you will see, that fund also has climate change activity within it as well. So, so they've all kind of been brought under the one fund. So it is difficult to identify specific funds where you can go and apply for monies to run PB processes. Um, there's not big, many big national funds at the minute disseminating funds through participatory budgeting. So really, I suppose this is about us starting to chat about how we can look at this a wee bit more out the box. Um, so people like local funders. So with that, I'm talking I'm talking mainly about public funders there. But you you do have there is funds locally, and things like community planning partnerships like um, health and social care partnerships, police, fire and rescue also have access to funding or certain pots of funding there. And it's about how do we, how do you potentially access the funds as well? Um, understandably, if you're going to run the PB process yourself, obviously it's a kind of, it's a bigger, it's a bigger thing and, and maybe that's for bigger voluntary organisations to look at. But that's that's an avenue of funding. So sometimes I suppose what we were chatting about is do we need to wait till these funds come out? Or is this now about us as communities saying, no, we want to run this PB process? Where can we find the funds? Who can we approach for this? So I suppose what I'm trying to discuss or start the discussion here is just to think about do we always go to national funders? I came from a frontline community anchor organisation. We always went to big funders. We had some service level agreements with um, local partnerships where we access money to disseminate things like one of the most PB. Um, but we, again, only knew about that because we were already involved in that field. So I suppose it's just pointing out there is local funders there. Your councils, your local public authorities will have monies. And it's about how do you access the right people just to start that conversation about could this be done through PB. There's also additional funding opportunities, local businesses, sometimes in certain areas will give sponsorship for things. That's a, another possibility that if we have the relationships with local businesses or coalition of businesses or small business gateways, there might be avenues there that if you if you know somebody, you can have that conversation. And I suppose it's about pitching what their objectives are and what they would like to meet. And is this, is it appropriate for a PB exercise? Would that help? Do you know? And also there's something about creating your own income. Um, and there's a question around about, should we wait for big funding opportunities to come out or should we look at how we can fund PB activity locally on our own merit? So say we had quite a strong, for example, regional network of hubs. Is there something we can do around about community lotteries? Because I mean, that, that's a popular thing that's done in certain areas. But, and then what happens with the funds is, People get money, like one winner gets money every month, but then the rest of the money is put out in a kind of community grant space model. Is there space there to look at that as a PB model? Could it be that we do community lotteries or crowdsourcing with the aim of if you're donating money, this is what it is going to do? So there's something to be said around about that. And also significantly for the climate change um, area and field, wind farm monies. I mean, there is huge amounts of monies come in sometimes to community councils from wind farms. Is that a conversation we could be having with community councils to say, how are you disseminating this money? A lot of the times it's disseminated very well through, um, again, community grant space models. But is this something we could look at using a proportion of that in our kind of participatory budgeting process? So that, that and I'll stop sharing at this moment. So that's our thinking round about it. And I'm wondering if MD wants to chip in any comments or anything round about what I've just said? Because as I say, we're very, very early and we're trying to just start to navigate this. Pat, you've got your hand up. Hello. Sorry, I'm just unmuting. Yep. Um, yeah, number, a number of things about funding. I love the idea of perhaps having some kind of list of possible ways of getting funding, which aren't the obvious ones, so I love that. 
Um, about funders, I have two issues with funders, and I think there's a huge issue about educating funders. One is this whole question, somebody's already raised it, of you have a wonderful program, it's very successful, it's having a major outcome, and they won't refund it, and you have to rethink it and come up with something new and innovative. And I think that is just, to me, it's crazy, it doesn't make sense. And the other thing funders are not good at is giving you time. So if you're serious about doing this in a way that you are going to engage with your local community, you need time for that. That's not instant. And funders tend to have very tight time frames. The third thing was the point about needing a bank account. And I think there's something about, certainly it's something, one of my hats is I'm on the board of Outside the Box, we're a community development support organization. And one of the things we've looked at in the past is, would there be a way of setting up some kind of thing, whatever it might look at, look like, which would actually provide that shelter, if you like, for small community groups, so that they wouldn't necessarily need their own bank account. So mm -hmm. that's just an idea. Mm -hmm. A couple of things, just to add in my experience around uh, PB and microfunding. Um, around development trust and, and like it, it said earlier about the event that we had distribute the microfunding. And that's part of what, as we build capacity, certainly in small community groups around climate action, um, there is a microfunding and, and, a, and, a, and a PB element that could be very successful there. But what we, what we had done is allowed the development trust to be the banker. So we just had uh, cash in a safe. And if that particular organization had a limit of 500 pounds to spend, then they just came in and said, well, can I have a, I want to go buy some shovels. Here's uh, 50 pounds, come back with the receipt. And, and, and that kind of eliminates the micro funding aspect with that. But that again is geographically specific into a small um, uh, area and a state or something where whereas well you know a lot of this this work is 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 going to be very valued in when adjust transition as we build in, in supporting areas of deep deprivation so that's mm -hmm. kind of some of the pv stuff that's been done already in, at least in scotland anyway so. yeah. on to that i think the idea of local development trust holding funding is a really good idea mm -hmm. i'm just shaking that down pat any other oliver yeah, just just following on that, and well, I and also just uh, also echoing what Pat was saying uh, about well, both the the short term funding for long term issues, which is absolutely appalling, and we are, I mean, in the, we have a national strategic group on PB. Um, with all kinds of um, public bodies and civil, uh, and civil society organizations. And this is one of the issues that we are looking at. We have a subgroup on, on culture shift and changing that culture, but that's going to take time. But the other thing as well is that we did a, um, a European project, which included the UK, Denmark, um, in the UK, both England and Scotland, and then also um, uh, Netherlands. And one of the conclusions and one of the contrasts with mainland Europe was the this obsession um, about this bias towards innovation. Instead of sustaining good practices that are already in place, here there is uh, by default a bias towards innovation. So people are having to do acrobatics to kind of redress things that are working well as if they were new and it's such a total waste of time and it's also a bad philosophy i mean innovation is fine but it shouldn't be the primary um so we are having those conversations with funders as well and there are funders who get it like coda foundation the robertson mm -hmm. trust so i think there are some inroads but it's early days just for info and i'll post a, a link in the chat there is an initiative in Edinburgh uh, led by Leah Black uh, from Western Hales from Wales, um, and uh, she seconded at EVOC, the, the Edinburgh Voluntary Organizations Council, and they are looking at something they are calling the Regenerative Challenge Fund, which is looking at a 10-year framework for funding based on trust rather than the other case. So I'll post a link to that and I hope they are successful because they could show the way on this. And then the other final point I'll make um, is building on, on Gordy's point about development trusts. I mean, you know, the, for the Northeast pilot, which it is a million, but it really is nothing to be honest, because across the three, I don't want to say it's nothing, it's important. And by the way, it is the largest part of PV in Scotland so far. So that is all true. But in the scale of the challenge we're facing, obviously that needs to be scaled up uh, manifold. And 
for that to happen, one of the good things about it, though, is that a big chunk of it, the majority of it, goes to capital uh, expenditure, which to me is an opportunity to connect with the development trusts movement to invest in, ass in assets that, that may uh, generate revenue and to create independent sources of funding so we're not always dependent on the state. And I think that that has to be a, a core part of this movement, the connection to the development trust movement. So we're not always just chasing uh, external funds. Uh, but I know it's, it's not easy, uh, but, but many are trying and some development trusts are doing really well. Perfect, thanks Oliver. All right, just around funding and, and my experience delivering projects across a number of climate challenge funded, but uh, RCGF funding, you know, large, um, various pots of money. But I think it's about a pathway, and, and I think the PB is 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 a pathway for a lot of these organizations as we work through climate action and building capacity and collaboration. I think um, it's a pathway to, um, I, I use the word sustainable, but effectively organizations that can fund themselves down the road or at least become partially funded, um, whether it's a development trust building leisure assets that are you know carbon neutral which is i've just been involved with that that they now have a business plan that's sustainable that they can deliver carbon out climate action in their community um but they have uh they're doing it with a with a social enterprise model that effectively they'll be self-sufficient in what they do and i think that's important that we can't you know the, the climate challenge fund was great but it was effectively a fire an act of fireworks it was just we had lovely blooms everywhere but but when the fireworks was done it all just faded away and we all had to go home again um and i think that versus now where i think we're looking at to use that same scenario is maybe we're more looking at a drone event that we have a bunch of lit drones that uh, that'll make a beautiful event but we can just bring them down again and put them back up again whenever we want um, or need. And, and that's kind of a scenario around that I've just kind of played over my head. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's about a pathway. And I think how this participatory budget is key in building collaboration with groups in areas or across themes, whether it's geographical areas, whether it's themes around climate actions, whether those other sub themes around that youth work being one of them. Um, uh, I think it's a pathway to that, and and that's that's just about what I'd like to say. PB the pathway. You're coining a new phrase. Go do I like it, <laughs> Brian? You've got your hand up. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I'm very new to this. This has uh, just come across this topic, and I think it is something that should be going forward with. Uh, one of the aspects of being a volunteer is that you start off a project, you get a bit of funding. And then you're so busy with the project itself, it's difficult to get into funding mode again. Yeah. You know, you need to change your brain set, if you like, to go into funding. And I find that very, very difficult. And it is a very competitive space as well. So if you don't have the right collection of words, it can be difficult. You know? mm -hmm. And in terms of making presentations, some of us are just not used to that. You know, even speaking to a forum like this is new for me. So, uh, you know, getting up and making a presentation and competing with others just doesn't float my boat. So there might be uh, other ways you have to perceive as well to catch these people that are put off by that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But thank you very much. It's been very, very informative. Thank Perfect. You. And thank you so much for your input, Brian. And I think you actually raise a very good point about the presentation uh, because there is people that's not comfortable with it. Um, and we've seen that in kind of PB activity across the country and where, where that's... Where that's happened, there's been various, I'm not going to say PB's perfect, it's never it's never perfect. Um, and there's been various scenarios where some people haven't went forward because it must, it had to be a, a frontline presentation. But the, then there's been other really good examples of where the people that were running the PB process have had thought about that and had had these conversations. And therefore, where people were not comfortable speaking in front of people or doing a marketplace, they were able to film maybe videos or present stuff online um, that was accessible so that that took that fear out of it from them and, and reduced that barrier. Because at the end of the day, that's a barrier. If people don't co feel comfortable in the process, then it becomes a barrier. But it's a really valid point. Um, and I'm really glad that you're new to the arena, though, and you're you're quite you're quite excited about the prospect of PB. That makes me happy. Yeah. And I still don't know how to do presentations, and I've been in this game a long time. <laughs> Oliver. Yeah, I'm conscious that I've been speaking too much, so apologies for that. This is the final thing I'm going to say, but but 
Um, the thing is, you know, since 2010, we've had 400 PV processes in Scotland. So there is a wealth of experience and chances are that somewhere near you, you that there will, there will have been some experience. But it's only now, I think, that there is enough of a critical mass and investment that is going to take off properly. And it's, it hasn't entered the main public imagination yet. You don't see it in the media. So there's a lot of work to be done on that. And, and the National PV Group is trying to work towards that. Um, but in terms of practical steps, because I've always, many of us have for a long time, including Philip here and many others, have seen the connection between PB and climate action, because climate action is the what, and PB can be part of the how, if we are serious about community-led uh, regeneration, community-led climate action. Um, you know, so uh, so in terms of keeping connected to, to this space, the, um, I posted there the, the uh, link to, the, to PB Scotland, which is our national network, um, and the Green PB group that has emerged within that, which Francesca leads, and I think that that's a good way of keeping in touch, just signing up for the newsletter and then seeing the connections. And the final one, and this is also a practical uh, step for, for which might or might not be relevant to some of you, you know, the best chance we have of making Green PB a really, really big thing in Scotland and really shift, um, you know, the, the, the dial on this and, and make it a, a, a real instrument for climate action is to make the Northeast pilot as a complete success. And Nescan is involved in that. So, you know, any support that can be lent to Nescan, anything that can be done to, you know, or if you're intrigued and you want to see how it works, if there are opportunities to go and, and shadow some of the people involved, chipping and some of the things they're going to be doing over the next few months, or just get in touch so that they can keep you posted. I think, you know, the, the best way to learn about these things is to see them work in practice. And we have the best possible scenario, which is this 1 million across the Northeast over the next few few months, all needs to be done and dusted by March or April, I think. So, you know, uh, if that one succeeds, then it could multiply. And, and that's when there will be many more opportunities. And I think that's our best bet in terms of increasing the funding and then making this a real critical mass of, of processes across the country. Uh, with with um, all seriousness, thank you so much. I think the discussions have been really, really useful. Um, as I say, fill out the jam boards. Over the weekend, if you want, there'll be lights going out and everything that will capture everything. And yeah, just thank you so much. There's so many things going around in my head of the stuff that was brought up. It's been really, really good. Um, and we'll get some kind of post event report round as soon as we can. And anything that you're feeding back, I'll feed back into recommendations to go to our European partners as well. So let's have confidence in the fact that we'll do that as well. Philip, you've still got your hand up. You want to come in again? Yes, yeah, so I just before we close, I just wanted to come in briefly, Francesca, just to well, just give a vote of thanks really to, to you in particular, Francesca, for uh, uh, pulling this session together and, and all, all your input. Um, but but also to Oliver, obviously, as well, for his um, contributions, uh, which is much valued. Uh, and um, well, Joanna and the background as well has done a lot to bring the session together as well. And everybody else at SCAN and all you for your participation in what I think has been a really interesting discussion. So, yeah, thank you.